your two choices are avoid getting more seriously abused by abusing others and getting to go home or refusing to get to the level where you abuse others and get abused and have your parents think that you're not reformed enough and you have to keep being abused. Those are your choices. Unwinnable situation. That is so fucked up. It's fucked up. I'm so fucked up. It is just so damn fucked up. That's fucked up. Hey, Fallon. Hey, Ash. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm, Good I'm start. not going to lie. I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not excited. I'm not crying. You are. I was crying during the last episode. Fuck, man. This is it's heavy. This is heavy. It's so heavy. You guys, welcome back to That's So Fucked Up, a comedy podcast, you know, about really dark things because dark humor helps us. Like cults and crime and other stuff, like the troubled teen industry that makes you say, ugh, that's so fucked up. Like I said so many times yesterday, and hi, we're your hosts. I'm Ashley Love Richards. And I'm Fallon Mori. And I really thought you were going to say stuff that makes you go like, because <laughs> that's how I feel today <laughs> about this stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, I can't. I can't mimic crying, you know. I know. It would feel weird if I was like, things that make you go, (laughs) that's so fucked up. Um, But I mean, that is obviously how how I feel emotionally. But what's about it is the people, namely the adults who are running this industry, they are disgusting garbage can humans but we will talk more about that later we actually have some pretty exciting news to share which is so rarely the case so yay i know immediate action which is yes oh Oh my god music to my ears oh so good so there is sometimes a silver lining so fallon are you ready to tell me about episode two i am ready so we're just gonna jump right into it let's real quick give a trigger warning yeah yeah there's definitely a trigger warning here for all kinds of situations of described child abuse and like child control there's (sighs) there is no graphic sexual abuse content in these so in this one so there is no trigger for that here, but the child abuse description and just emotional. In every other sort of way. Every, Psychological, yeah. physical. Yeah. So that. Yeah. There's a lot of heavy, I would say heavier than I've probably ever felt in a documentary, like moments of emotional distress that people talk about. And so that is a huge trigger warning. Mm. Mm-hmm. So just be prepared. But I think it's really important that we get the news out far and wide. So we're going to truck through it. (laughs) Yeah. So here we go. You guys, this is the second part. Make sure to listen to part one, which came out yesterday. It lays a lot of the really important groundwork. We meet a lot of the survivors for the first time. You really, really need to listen to that one. So do that. Yes. So this is episode two of the Netflix series, The Program. And this episode is called Mind Control. And we are coming off of the last episode where we got an introduction to Catherine and some of her fellow survivors from the Academy at Ivy Ridge. And so they have been sort of in and out of like digging through the leave behinds of this Academy that went defunct in 2005. It's so wild how they just leave all of the evidence there. Why? I think it shows an incredible amount of ego because yeah. they truly think even if we leave concrete evidence, we're untouchable. They can't do shit. Yeah. So, Ugh. yeah. We start out this episode with a kind of in-depth look at what are called the seminars. And the episode opens with, you know, some displays of news articles from it looks like the late 90s maybe or early 90s even talking about programs similar to the one at Ivy Ridge and they show like students that are sitting in groups and holding hands and doing weird exercises where they have to keep their arms up and Catherine starts talking about 
what are called the seminars. And what these were, were pseudo psychological seminars that were required for the kids at Ivy Ridge. And they were held every four to six weeks. It kind of reminded me of like when you talk about the Scientology bridge, how you have to pass this one to go to this one and then this one to go to this one, like down the line. It was sort of like that. Hold on. Do you realize what you just said? What? Down the line. And I had told you before, I was like, there's kind of like an MLM aspect. Oh, we get there too. Uh huh. (laughs) Even more so. Yeah. But it was just funny that you just said down line, essentially. Yes. So you had to complete these seminars to complete the program. And you had to do this by basically conforming to their groupthink and participating in these exercises that were teaching you not to question their ideology. Alexa, who we met in the last episode, says that really during these, they were food and sleep deprived and they were heavy on physical exertion components. They show this one exercise that the kids had to participate in where the staff would wrap a towel, like a rolled up towel in duct tape, and then make all the kids sit on the floor and bang this towel on the floor as hard as they could and scream. And she said that they would do that for an hour or more. And if you stopped because, you know, your arms get tired, how dare you? They would say that you chose out of the seminar. And what choosing out of the seminar meant was that you would go to another seminar called Breakpoint, which meant that they were going to break you. That's why it was called Breakpoint. Dude, okay, you guys listen. (laughs) If you go to Africa or Thailand or anywhere that they offer elephant riding or tiger petting, don't do it, okay? Because the tigers are drugged. They don't want you petting them. And the elephants, what they do is very similar to what they do to these children. So that's great. In the troubled teen industry, they are literally, quote, trying to break their spirits and will. And that's what they try to do to, or that's what they do to elephants too. When they're babies, they break their spirits so that they don't have to like actually hold them. When they're older, they can just. I don't I even. I'm, this is. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm telling you this. It's they. They can be in a stall though, with just one of their legs chained to the ground, and because they've been broken, they won't go anywhere. And that's actually what's called learned helplessness in mm-hmm. person psychology. psychology. Yep. And that's what happens to these kids too. Yes. You realize no matter what you do, you're fucked. Right. So the girls describe what they experienced at one of these breakpoint seminars. And what these were, were like, if you choose out, meaning you happen to get tired during the physical exertion of the other seminar, you get sent to breakpoint. And they talk about how they did this exercise over and over. And um, Alexa and another woman sit down and they start doing this thing where they go palms up, palms down, palms together, palms apart, palms up palms down, palms together, palms apart. And on the documentary, they do it for a minute straight. And the girls Mm -hmm. immediately are like in like robot mode. And at the end, they're both shaking like, oh, my God, we're feeling things from this. And Alexa says even doing it for one minute made her feel particular things. But when they had to do it, they did it for eight straight hours. Palms up, palms down, palms together, palms apart, palms up, palms down, palms Uh together, palms apart. For eight hours. Eight hours without stopping. No water, no nothing. And they said at the end of these, you would just completely disassociate. And once you do that, your mind is kind of broken and they can fill it with whatever they want. Super weird, like not cult-like tactics at all. You definitely couldn't go to tsfethepodcast.com and play cult bingo and light the fuck up out of your board. I tried playing yesterday and... You had talked for 10 minutes and I got a bingo. I forgot that if you click the last (laughs) one, like your board disappears. And I was like, well, I got to start again. And I had to like hold back from clicking all the swears. So, Uh, yeah. So we hear from Dr. Yanya Lalik and she says the different programs will try different techniques. And by inventing things for people to do that are ridiculous, you're getting them to give up their sense of self and their individualism. And Seminars at Ivy Ridge were actually modeled after group therapy techniques, such as large group awareness training. (gasps) 
Uh-huh. And if you heard about, or if you watched our episode on holiday magic, where they held <laughs> seminars, where they like yeah. beat people and peed on them, like they also pulled from that training. Elgats. 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 Yeah. At holiday magic, they sent them to a particular Elgat that they had to fillet dildos. Actually, you know where I learned that is the book Help at Any Cost by Maya Salovitz, who is interviewed often in the documentary shout out she's fucking dope we're gonna get to that book too because they bring it up in the doc yeah actually so these workshops actually if you're not familiar they became really popular in the 60s during a time called the human potential movement and i did look this up because i i wasn't super familiar but this was a counterculture movement that believed that extraordinary potential lied untapped in all people and by doing all these really extreme exercises you could get people to live lives of happiness and fulfillment. So they would do all types of weird therapies like primal scream therapy and like holding hands and breathing therapy. You know what that reminds me of? What? Dude. <laughs> Fucking the Rajneeshis. Oh yeah, for sure. That's so of that era. Yeah. <laughs> Yanya Lalik says many groups use high arousal techniques and they obviously are designed to increase self-awareness. But Maya Salovitz, who you just talked about, wrote that book. She starts to get interviewed often. We'll just call her Maya from now on. But she says, if you put people through these experiences, then sometimes they will start to believe that they changed their lives. Alexa says she believed when she got through doing these that she had beat out all the bad stuff. But now she just realizes it's because she was told to and they were trying to just get through it. It's very similar to how when maybe you go to like a mega church service Mm -hmm. and hey, you guys, I'm not saying I'm saying whatever makes you feel good as long as it's not hurting other people is your jam. But I will say that in mega churches and in filmmaking, whatever, so many scenarios, they use music as a very intense manipulation tool. Like when you feel that like Beating, dude, I've been to a couple services, okay? I've been to some pretty fucking Christian AA services. When you feel that that drum beating and it's, ah, the energy, you, you know what I'm, dude, you've yes. been to the shit. You know what I'm talking about. I know that people, when we said MLM was, uh, even though I said my own experience on the podcast before, somebody said that I only use Wikipedia, but I didn't write the Wikipedia. I was actually in Amway, so. Who said that? Who on said one of our that? reviews, it was like, your whole episode was from Wikipedia. And I was like, my whole episode was from me being in the company, dude. Dude, MLM people get super mad. Super mad. But their rallies use the same technique. Like they'll put on big pumping music and then they'll put on like the same music over and over in between and they'll make you do like chants that are the same. They're doing the same thing. Oh, don't get me wrong. Uh, Catherine, amazing job. Don't know who did the music. I didn't look up the credits, but at the end... When Alexa is singing on the piano, that's a perfect example of music being used in a way at a time to just fucking like grab you emotionally and make you have an experience. And that's that's used often. Yeah. And these big group things. Yeah. So Catherine says that it was used to put them in a meditative state, the music, and they would use personal details about how, for example, Catherine's mom died and they would yell at them with all the people around in front of people about these details. They would encourage her to scream at her mom about how angry she was that her mom died. And she's like, my mom died of cancer. It's not her fault. I'm not mad at her for dying. Like, what are you doing? Like, um, well, you should be. Pound it out, sister. So <laughs> I do want to give a trigger warning for this part. This part really got me hard um, when I listened to it, not because I have a personal experience, but because it was just really emotional in general. So if you have a parent or something that's passed away, you might want to fast forward about a minute. But Diana says that as part of the seminars, they would tell her that she needed to be accountable for her dad dying. But her dad died in a car accident that she was in with him when she was just three years old. The car had rolled numerous times and landed upside down. She says, as she's talking to Catherine, that the accident should have been the worst thing that happened to her. And while seeing her dad die was really hard, her time at Ivy Ridge was worse. Dude. This is so fucking gnarly, this part. You see excerpts from 
the staff's notes about Diana and they all have these little phrases highlighted like she's playing the victim. She expects everyone's pity. And then she talks about and you see an essay where they made her write that her dad's death was all her fault including breaking up their family. And they showed that she had a name tag where they wrote trashy mistake as her like name for the seminar because they said it was a mistake that she lived and her dad died. How fucked. I am utterly fucking. It made me want to throw up. It made me sick. The mental and emotional abuse of that. It's immeasurable. Yeah. No, it makes me. Mm hmm. I got through it. Also, (laughs) ah, it's just wild because in AA, when you work your fourth step, you have to take accountability for everything that's ever happened to you. If I'm real holding resentment towards you for cheating on my boyfriend with me, Fallon, Mm -hmm. or with you're my friend, you're my co-host, and you cheated with my partner. So I'm holding resentment towards you, but I have to find my part in that. like okay, you did this bad thing, but that's not my responsibility. My responsibility in that is what's my part in that? It's so self-blaming and shaming. It's nuts. I was like, so what's my part in like being abused as a child? And my sponsor said that it's that I'm holding on to resentment as an adult. Bullshit. So future self caused past self to be abused? (sighs) I should have forgiven, you know? Mm. And we're about to get to what you just said and (laughs) why in a minute. So (laughs) (laughs) at the seminars, they did a couple other things like the only nonverbal gestures they ever were allowed to use was a letter V on their forehead. And I'm showing Ash what it looks like, but it looks like you're putting up a two and holding it against your forehead. And that Mm -hmm. was what you would show to other students to let them know that they were playing the victim because you're supposed to take part of the abuse of other kids. Right. And make sure that you're shaming people. Yeah. That's how you graduate, which we'll get to eventually too. And generally, if you can keep the focus on somebody else, then it's Mm -hmm. not on you. It's a survival tactic. They also find a makeup palette in the stuff on the floor of the center. And they relate how part of this seminar was to really humiliate themselves. They would make people put on makeup and dress up in costumes often. And this is the wording they used often cross-dressing. Sean, who I don't know if we met last time, he was in the program for two years and he was sent there when he was 15 years old. He said that his song he always had to perform was in a red dress dancing around the circle to I'm too sexy by right said Fred. And Catherine says they ruined all these good songs for us. (laughs) That's a great song. God damn it. Well, she's talking about like girls just want to have fun. That's one of the ones she mentions. Like they ruined all these songs because they're associated with this like traumatic memory. Overall, she summarizes and said the goal is to break you down, humiliate you and modify your behavior, which is their overall tactic anyway. And then there is this really powerful montage I can't really do justice to, but The adults are like, some of them are in the old school uniforms they found. They're like doing what they would have done as students, like screaming and beating the floor. Catherine is walking around pretending to be like the facilitator. And Alexa is voicing over like all of the things that were messages that they got through these seminars, which is you are to blame. You are deceitful. You're weak. You're pathetic. Everything that happened to you is (sighs) your fault and you need to take accountability for it. And everything will be fixed if you work the program. (laughs) No, yeah, no, this is... And here is why. Ah. Ah. So then we start to get into the section where we talk about the origins of the TTI. And as Ash has mentioned before... TTI mind control techniques make a lot of sense if you know that the whole thing was based on a cult called Synanon. And if you're not familiar, you've probably heard Ash say it before, but Synanon was a cult that was started in Santa Monica, California in 1958 by a guy named Charles Dietrich. He was actually involved in AA, but thought AA was not tough enough. And it shouldn't be that people work the steps, but you should have the steps imposed upon you forcefully. So the whole work the program, it works if you work it. Chuck Dietrich stole that right from AA, right put from it AA. into synanon which turns into the tti correct so it's like it's triggering language i mean through this documentary i learned a lot about why i feel very 
empathetic towards mm-hmm. the survivors of the TTI, despite never having been sent to a facility. And as you know, there are people who are also deep in like AA that are convinced for years now that they cannot survive without it because they're flawed and it's taught them they have to do this program to like oh, be a AA good is like you are an alcoholic first and foremost for the rest of your life. The program works if you work it. And if you fail, it's because you're not working the program. And it's the only way to stay sober. Yep. And you guys listen, if anybody tells you that their way is the only way, peace out because they're lying. Yeah. So uh, (laughs) Charles Dietrich takes what he learned in AA and he sets up a residential treatment program in California for heroin addicts where he uses what's known as attack therapy as a primary tool, which is you find a weak point in somebody and you as the leader and everyone else go after that person. Maybe for 24 straight hours, if that person is, I don't know, is... (laughs) I don't know. I'm just laughing at the absurdity of that. Say somebody, um, they were a sexual abuse victim when they were right. a child. If you're a victim of anything, they have the kind of like Scientology and so many other cult and religion mentality is that it's your fault and that right. you made that happen to you somehow in Scientology called. They're like, how did you pull that in? Exactly. So they attack a person over and over, maybe for 24 straight hours or more in his method. Maya says, as you are more and more attacked, your thinking becomes less and less clear. And eventually you just get so tired that you're more likely to adopt the leader's ideology. So after Synanon disbanded, former Synanon members start treatment programs for kids. And they do it for kids they believe are troubled, quote unquote. These got super popularized by, of fucking course, Nancy Reagan during her Just Say No campaign. Fuck you, Nancy Reagan. To the point where she even brought Princess Diana to a center to like show off all the troubled kids they were helping. They're not helping anyone. They show these videos of kids in these earlier programs. And there's this woman who's like standing up in a, there's like a hundred people in this room and she's screaming at who you realize is her daughter. You're worthless. I'm so disgusted with you. And at the end she goes, I love you. And the girl is like, I love you too, mom. You can tell she's forced to say that. Yeah, tough love, as they call it, was just all the rage in the 80s. Yeah, the whole pull yourself up by your bootstraps because it's all your fault mentality without any tools, by the way. So Yanya comes in and says, you know, they're tearing apart your self-esteem and your trust in yourself. And by virtue of that, essentially, they take away your whole self. There's this awful clip where you see a little girl I swear she can't be more than like 10 years old and there's a guy in the room yelling at her that if they went around and asked every person in that room every person would say that she sucked as a person they would want to cut her throat and that they would be relieved for no longer having to deal with an ingrate like you this girl might be 10 what the fuck man saying that everybody in this room wants to viciously murder you right and this girl is you can tell she's sobbing and that's part of her therapy so that's clips from not ivy ridge it's from like earlier versions of trouble teen schools or trouble teen prisons elon was the first one no it was actually synanon and then Synanon branches out into three different ones and they show like a quick map on the screen. So Elon might have been one of the earlier ones, but it was actually something called Phoenix House and then CEDU. And then from there, it goes down into other programs. Some of are called The Seed, Straight Incorporated, and then finally, the Worldwide Association of Specialty Programs. Which is what Ivy Ridge falls under the umbrella of. Correct. And actually, Lester Roloff, who is, I think he sat down, but he was like a leader in the independent fundamentalist Baptist church. Mm -hmm. And he started troubled teen homes that were IFB run. Right. Circle of Hope that is now shut down because their fucking daughter, who's incredible fucking whistleblowed on them they were an ifb boarding school so ifb runs a lot of these too which also brings in a fun religious abuse element 
Right. But even here, their homeschool curriculum is Christian-based, which it is, is interesting. Yeah. So at this point, they sort of transition back to the present and they're back at the they're back at Ivy Ridge and they're talking to a girl named Molly, who I think this is the first time we meet her. She was sent away at 14 years old for 15 months. They are laughing because they're like, yeah, remember the one time you got in trouble because you tripped over me and I laughed about it. And that was the example of something she got in trouble for. Here's the kicker about oh, that's like a, that's a fucking unapproved laugh. Or unauthorized something. communication. Oh, my God. So oh. the thing that kills me about Molly is her parents had first sent her little brother to a program called Majestic Ranch. And that was a troubled kids place that took in kids as young as seven doing this to seven year olds, which is I... the age of my youngest child, which blows my mind. I can't. Molly, though, was a straight A student. No problems at all. No drugs, no alcohol, no getting in trouble. They just sent her and her brother to Ivy Ridge because they thought it would bring their family closer together. I want <laughs> you guys. I sent my I perfect I have sent my perfect child with no problems to a school where she was treated like she to had a problems. therapeutic boarding school where I had no contact with her to bring us closer together. Like, I'm sorry. Who are those? Okay, you know what? I'm not going <laughs> to speak ill of people's parents because I don't know where they're at in their relationships. I just... And we'll learn a, a little later <sighs> in this episode how much they target parents and I'm not going to mm -hmm. say parents are excused from their responsibility but you do see how they work it as a big system to get people to get into this program so yeah they start to talk here about something called the family rep and each group um, of students were organized into something called families and they would have these family meetings every single day and basically like some kind of almost like an intervention group. So during the day, these family groups, the students would stand up and talk about what they were feeling and then students in the group would give them feedback and it was mostly like you're being a victim, you're a victim, you're playing a victim, you need to work your program, et cetera, et cetera. Can I give you some feedback, Fallon? <laughs> no. Right? That's they give that's that's yeah. how they gave the example. Yeah, they stand up and they're like, Can we give you feedback? It's ridiculous. The adults on the program acted out. I'm not gonna go through it line by line. It was the only time as lower level in the program students that they were actually able to speak out loud. And it was the only time they could talk to their family rep who was supposed to be the person that had direct liaison between the I don't know when call them students, the victims and their families. Yeah. yeah, it's supposed to be their fucking advocate is what they think. So basically, the family reps were supposed to talk to the parents or families once a week when their kids could not and give them updates. But in the documentary, they find a list of talking points that the family reps were supposed to use to talk to the parents. And they were things that were addressing like concerns about the abuse tactics, the isolation, the restraint. It's like, here's how we can make sure we continue to sell the school. Here's a list of FAQs uh -huh. and red flags that get frequently brought up. And here's exactly what you can say to rebuttal that. And family reps are incentivized to sell the program to parents and keep the kids there longer. There is a percentage table outlined there, just like you see on the page of every MLM that shows how much your percentage increases of your bonus for every kid that you put in the program that's over the age of 18, every kid under the age of 18, how many from a family, et cetera. So like an MLM. And then we find out later too that the, um, the parents get incentivized by, oh, your kid gets a free month if you right. get another family signed up. Right. It's, it's very MLM. So even if it's not like an MLM, it's like affiliate marketing. Yeah. If you buy this influencer's code for a beauty product that they get a kickback. It's like that, but for selling your children. Yeah, super cool. Wild. They say that if your family rep didn't like you, you were kind of going to be stuck in the program. You're not going to have good relations with your parents and you're not going to go anywhere. Alexa tells her story and says that her family rep, when she checked in, told her that her drug test upon entry lit up like a Christmas tree. And she's like, are you fucking kidding me? I had never taken a drug in my entire life. 
So she knew it had to be false, but she also knew she had no way to refute it. And the only way they would say that she was working her program was if she lied and said she was doing drugs. So she starts to slowly tack on all these stories about drug use that she's doing, which she didn't know anything about doing drugs. She's like, I guess I smoke crack. If that's what you do with it, she doesn't know anything about drugs. Right. And it keeps getting reinforced by all the staff who expect her to say that she did drugs. So Maya comes in again and says, teenagers especially are highly likely to make false confessions. Pushing them even a little bit can make them make false confessions. And like kids would would make confessions that were like beyond believability and mostly not true. They flash back to that time that Nancy Reagan had brought Princess Di to a troubled teen (laughs) center. Yes. And they're sitting in the audience, and the girl stands up and she's like, I've used PCP, mescaline, heroin, uh, uh, LSD. You can tell she's reciting a list somebody gave her. She names every Every drug drug under the sun in the world. This 15 year old girl has done every drug in the world under the sun. Like nobody even has that much money. So they've all allegedly participated in sex work to to get their fix. You know, these kids have never even seen drugs. A lot of them. Alexa said by the time she was getting further in the program, she was saying like a huge list of drugs that she had done. She's done zero, by the way. And the list keeps growing because the staff expects her to keep adding to it. And this is very common. It's like if you don't confess doing something, they'll just say you're a liar. So eventually people just start making up stories to appease the questioners. Yanya comes in here and notes that getting people to confess something is what they do, not because they believe in it, but they do it so they have collateral against you. Mm. They specifically bring up other cults like Nexium and Scientology, like how when you walk into a Scientology building from that point on, every single thing you say is documented. Every casual interaction you have is completely documented. Alexa gets given the name Crack Whore. Because during the seminars, you had to wear a name tag that was not your real name. And so hers was crack whore. Like trashy mistake. Right. And crack whore. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. And she was forced to make confessions about how she was participating in sexual acts in exchange for crack. Total lies. So Alexa says she was just wanting to find her initial drug test to be able, when they started to find records at the school, to send her parents as an adult and prove that it was all wrong and maybe do something to help her family mend. Someone mailed her file to her and right on top, the drug test clearly says negative in like all capital letters. And what kills me about this is her parents still don't believe her. Yeah, she sent the evidence of the drug test being negative to her parents and her parents still believe the family rep that told them that she did drugs and not her. So Alexa takes a copy of her drug test results and on the bottom she writes, I'm not a crack whore, but you're still a liar and puts her phone number on it and puts it in the mailbox of the woman who was her family rep while she was at the school and says, let's see if she calls me back. Wait, I'm sorry. (sighs) Hold on. (laughs) Hold the phone. (laughs) That's a woman that she speaks to later on the phone. I think they use a voice modulator because I think they say we're going to put it in her mailbox. Okay. Okay. I think it's a voice modulator because remember they had the sides separated. Women teachers, men teachers. Right. I'm pretty sure she says it was a woman and I think they were disguising the woman's voice for, you know, like the way they do on documentaries when they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was like, that is wild. (laughs) (laughs) Catherine said the first time that she saw her family was actually at a seminar called PC1 or Parent and Child 1. She hadn't seen her dad in six months. The program made them do this weird thing where they walked to the front of their parents who were all like holding hands in a meditation circle and stood outside of arm's reach. And at the end, the people would be like, reach out and touch your child. Isn't that how distant they felt before they came here? Now open your eyes and embrace them. Like, weird my face right now you guys is <laughs> just shut the fuck up Pseudo scientific garbage so she got to see her dad and there's pictures of her looking happy seeing her father she's kind of like this with her stepmother with her arm barely over her shoulders at the end of the whole weekend she was allowed to see her sister for one hour 
her sister was in college and she drove flew and then drove like two hours just to be able to see her sister for an hour and Catherine said it meant so much to her and she said when she got there she was like she was just a freshman in college she's like I didn't know what to do but I realized how bad it was for you here because you looked so awful I wanted to just throw you in the back of my car and take you away but I didn't know what I should do and Catherine was so brainwashed that she was too scared to whisper to her sister because she knew that if she got caught she would go all the way back to zero points level one it's like a horror movie oh my god And then the one girl said she was up late French braiding her hair. So she looked pretty enough for her parents to take her home. And she asked, can you take me home before graduation? And she said that she said to them, I don't even want to go home right now. I just want to go home before I graduate. And her mom was like, we're committed to graduation. We're committed to graduation. That's what they drill into the parents to say. Catherine's dad said that too at some point. We're committed to you graduating or some." Something along those lines. Yep. That's because parents were often enticed to write full commitment letters to leave their kids to completion before they even understood what the program was about. So once kids knew they weren't getting out of the program, like their parents signed commitment letters, their goal was then to work the program and essentially just be a robot and don't get in trouble ever again. And they said that the way to do that was becoming upper level, which is, again, fourth, fifth, and sixth level. That's when you get to do crazy things like look out the window and talk and yeah, wear your hair, not in a braid, like real wild human rights. You also get one off the grounds visit with your family for a day. You're allowed to leave the facility within a two hour radius, but you have to return the same day by 8 p.m. And you have an entire list of rules in a contract that you have to sign. Some of the ones I grabbed from the screen were no internet or email, no R-rated movie watching, no communications with friends, only family, no driving, even recreational vehicles, and no asking to go home. No manipulation. Catherine talks to a lawyer we heard from in the last episode. His name is Phil Elberg. He is one of the first lawyers to ever successfully sue one of these programs. And Phil. Yeah. And he reads the contract and says, this is so sad. But he has heard that very commonly parents say, I don't understand this contract. Like, why wouldn't our kids just tell us how bad it was when it was just us alone? And She's like, because we were so afraid of getting sent back to level one and we're so brainwashed to think that they knew what we would do. So you see Catherine's dad is taping her and her sister on their visit, their their free day or whatever. And he's like, tell people how much you like it here. And she's like, I hate it here. Take me home. And she said she said it because her stepmother was farther away walking and she figured she'd take a chance because she knew if she said it in front of her stepmother, her stepmother would just tell the school. Yeah, I I just and dad's kind of like laughing in the background in the video like, okay, you hate it here. Just oh, you, you, you kooky teen, you. So they all go out to see a girl named Katie. Katie was 13 years old when she was sent there. And she has been slowly retrieving files from Ivy Ridge and personally just spending all her own time coordinating them, like going through every single piece of paper and lining up people's files by name, like everything she can find so that she can find the person and mail their file back to them to give people closure. Like out of the goodness of her heart. Yeah, it's it's really amazing what she's doing. She's got like two sheds full of paperwork boxes, and like one of them is stacks and stacks of ones she's already done. And there's like seventeen hundred files ready to be shipped or something. It overwhelmed me just to look at. Honestly, it's go, Katie. She just says what she wants is that she wants people to be able to read their files and know that what happened to them was not their fault. Catherine is there and says she wants to get some stuff together because she wants to present it to her dad. But since she has been doing the documentary and getting access to the files at the location, she 
had to cut off contact with him completely because she couldn't she couldn't handle it anymore. And she said she's not able to stop being angry at him. She refuses to speak to him. And when she was trying to decide, she's like, you know what? I want it to be 15 months because that's how long she had to be cut off from everybody. Mm -hmm. And every time it's like a birthday or a holiday, she said, I got through it by thinking like they didn't contact me for my birthday or my holidays. They just forgot me. She feels he has never really understood and he's never adequately apologized. And she wants him to understand what to be sorry for, not just to say it, but to understand the hopelessness and abandonment she felt. She said she started communicating with him by writing only. He has to earn his phone call. I love her. She's <laughs> she's really, I mean, she's great. I was watching the end of the third episode and I was like, I'm just... I'm just really proud of her because this is just so well done. Oh, my God. to Catherine. Yes. Like, oh. She's amazing. So this part, I jumped up off the couch and I was like, yes, you do it. She <laughs> said her dad responds to her written messages by calling her a whole bunch of times and being like, I really wish we could talk in person. And she responds with a message. And this isn't totally verbatim until the end, but she says basically... I understand it's frustrating for you not to be able to pick up the phone and solve this, but I was never allowed to pick up the phone either. And I'm sure that must be frustrating. And she ends mm. by telling him, mm -hmm. you still have a lot of learning to do. Work your program. Damn. Ah, boo, mic drop. Ah. I know. I was like, yes, do it. So interestingly enough, Katie's mom is there. Katie's the one who's been organizing the files. And she sort of starts off the discussion on parent manipulation. Katie's mom says there's no book on parenting. And when Katie was younger, she was acting out where she felt really scared. She would go to pick Katie up from the school bus when Katie was like 11 and Katie wouldn't be there. And so she's like, she would not know what happened to her daughter and she didn't know what to do. And she said that the organization kind of catches you when you're super vulnerable and eases your mind. And the parents in this system are the ones that they know that they're trying to influence the most. Mm -hmm. Yanya and some other experts sort of rapidly weigh in. They say, essentially, people are looking, just like in cults, people, meaning parents, are looking for simple solutions to difficult problems. They are convinced by the people in the programs that this is the only way to help your child. So parents are terrified and these places are getting to them somehow and going, if you don't put your kid in this program, they will die. They will end up in jail and die or they will just die. Right. Yeah. Either way, they're, they're going to die. And you see videos of a bunch of parents saying, well, my child was headed down a path to death or my child was going to die. And the lawyer we spoke to earlier says... Basically, let's be clear. The kids were not the ones in the cult. The parents were the ones in the cult. Yeah, this is where it gets, <laughs> this is where it gets wild. I mean, this is just another time that it gets crazy. This is just yet another of <laughs> 90 times one. in one hour it gets wild. Yeah. <laughs> so Catherine talks to a man named Roderick Hall, who's a clinical psychologist, and he says that they would likely find someone like if they were working on you as a parent to get you to send your kid there, they would find somebody in your community, whether it was your church community or where you lived, and they would get that person to call you and recommend the program. Oh, my daughter's there. She's doing so well. Quote, it really works. Those right. are the magic words. There's an MLM that's called It Works. I think they're defunct now, but isn't that funny? <laughs> of course. So Catherine's sister says that a lot of the evangelical families in their church community referred kids to the program. And it's really because Alexa's parents were recommending it to everybody. And later yeah. you're going to find out how she became like their poster child. <laughs> Katie's mom says... At this point, essentially, if you referred people, you would get a reward. If you refer someone, you get a free month. And that's like, for some people, three to $5,000. So they're saying, if you refer a family here, you get a free $5,000 or whatever. That is really a high price per month to have your kid tortured. The program, once they sort of get you on the hook, their next step is to convince 
your parents that your kids are manipulative. Basically, like when your kid comes here, they're going to call you. They're going to tell you crap to manipulate you about how bad it is. But they're lying. Remember, they are manipulators. Don't let them out early. Catherine reads a statement from the program that says any parents that they consider as wavering will then be called by a committee to make sure that they don't leave. So their goal is you're staying in no matter what. Yeah, that's not aggressive sales tactics or culty whatsoever. She actually reads this report that the school had filled out about her dad who had raised some red flags. That was literally called a red flags report. And it says Ken is difficult to work with and he has raised some red flags. Jane is the more level headed of the two. So the one admittedly abusive, by the way, in earlier mm-hmm. notes. Yeah is the more level-headed of the two. So they're going to meet with all three of them to make sure Jane is supported. But the good news is Catherine is still at Ivy Ridge. Oh, thank God. Thank God. The school also then sets up an internal message board online for parents where parents can communicate with each other for support, but they monitor it closely because they only leave comments and allow people to participate who are supportive of the school. Right. They delete any negative stuff. So Yanya basically says like all these messages are being said over and over to parents on these message boards by their friends, by everyone they know. And so eventually they're really like duped into it. And the parents get to go to seminars of their own. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Catherine sneaks into one and you see the parents doing all the same stupid shit, guided meditation, all this jargon on the walls, There's pictures they show of parents doing the whole cross-dressing, performing thing that the kids were made to do. Again, their words, not ours. But yeah, like you see a group of what I assume is fathers, they're men, Mm -hmm. and they're all in dresses. And ballet tutus. Yeah, just like one of the victims described, that's Mm -hmm. one of the means that they used to humiliate the kids too so it's like they're doing the same weird shit to the parents but they're making the parents feel like it's an act of togetherness not an also, act the parents of get to go home yeah alexa says also our parents get to leave yeah which is the best part for them our man comes up to Catherine and says like are you a part of this thing and she's like i don't know i'm working here and he's like oh okay she says how often do they have these and he's like it's about monthly and I've been to 10 of them in 13 months and she says well what's the goal and he's like the goal is whatever you want to get out of it whatever you want to get out of it you're going to get out of it Katie's mom says that's not vague right (laughs) exactly what MLMs say too Katie's mom says that She found at the time that the seminars were really helpful. They put you outside your comfort zone, but they force you to think about different stuff to like help you with things. Help you with the the wrestling that it is with keeping your child forcibly incarcerated. Right. It's rough. I'm sure that dressing up in a ballet tutu makes you feel better about your kid being incarcerated. Hmm. The guy who came up with both seminars is a man named David Gilcrease. He created all of the WASP seminar programs across all their programs. He was also a facilitator before this at another company. And he basically just took all of his facilitation and dropped it into the WASP program. Program completion was completely hammered into parents. They were basically lied to from the second they got in. So if parents came in and wanted to do a tour, they were taken to one specific office that's nicely decorated and wood paneling. So it looks like a legit school. They right. only ever go to one room. It's like really cool in the 70s. They, but... Funny enough, they don't get the tour of the hallway where kids are sleeping in like arms out posture yeah. on suicide watch. Weird. Yeah, it's weird. They don't get that part. David, who we met last time, he was in the program for two years. He said that he had done these tours and he would kind of, hey, put on this whole persona and talk about how I used to be a, a ruffian and now I'm, I face see things so differently. No, he's, he's black. So I don't think he was a gang member, but he, he says that. He's no, he like, says oh, that. Yeah. I used to be in gangs, but now yeah. I'm, you know, I've, I've turned a new corner and it's great here. And because if you say anything negative to the parents, yes. you fucked. Yeah, you go back to the beginning. Like mm-hmm. if a parent goes to the office and says, I didn't really like my tour guide, you're done. And you're probably going to go to the no camera room and get a beating. Yes, you would probably get a beating in the no camera room. Katie's mom says, well, I got to go on the tour. And if I had seen red flags on that tour, I would have gone right in and pulled you out. But I didn't. 
And she then Katie is talking in the same camera shot as her mom now. And she can't even look at her. And she's saying like, you know, she's saying they like talking about her family, like Katie's mom isn't even there. She says, I wish that we could have been a family and I wish that they wouldn't have abandoned me. Instead, I had, you know, I'm paraphrasing. She said, I had to feel scared, isolated. Everyone else's life went on while mine ended for 19 months. And her mom says, I didn't mean for you to feel that way. I can't go back and change it. And then she just starts hysterically crying and has to kind of stop the discussion. Yeah. And she like whispers to her, I'm sorry. And yeah, it's so I it's so hard. I understand that they're absolutely victims as well. And if you're going to drop your kid off at a facility, maybe say, I want to see where they're going to be sleeping and eating. Oh, yeah. And, you know, poke around a little. I noticed you haven't asked me about dietary restrictions or if my kid has illnesses or any health problems. Right, right. Can I see a list of your teachers and their credentials? Like nothing. Right. Yeah. You talked about this last time a little bit, so I won't go into it. But basically, they would make the kids go do all these staged events. They had them do a dance so that they could take photos. They had them do a barbecue. They had them all put on cheerleading uniforms and took a picture like, here's our cheerleading squad. (laughs) Right. And they, they, they're like, you know, but as kids, just like the chance to do anything that wasn't what we were doing all the time was cool. So it's like, all right, you want us to fucking play dress up to take a picture? Like, yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> it's be outside. But then it's yeah. like oh, doubly cool. is depressing when we have to go back inside and like realize right. this is our life has nothing to do with these things. Tom Nichols was the PR coordinator there, and he was originally a local politician that they hired to put a good spin on the program, but he's now a pastor at a church right down the road. So they go to his church. You don't get to see him, but you hear the audio. And Catherine's like, he's shocked that some of us are back here. And he's sort of like, well, no, I figured it happened eventually. And she goes, yeah, I guess everyone gets their uh, gets their deliverance or gets their whatever in the end. And they kind of make very small chit chat. And then she says, do you think the photos you took really represented what life was like for those kids at Ivy Ridge? And he's like, no. And so then she's like, how do you feel knowing parents were conned out of money? And then he goes, I'm not interested in being part of some 60 minute expose. And she's like, all right, thanks. And they leave. And she says, basically, this is a perfect example of why institutionalized abuse happens because every person does their little part to make it happen. But they, of course, never know that they're like taking part in some mass ritualized abuse. Oh, I didn't know. I was just a small cog in the wheel. It's so brilliant. At some point she goes, do you want to go outside so you're not lying in a church? (laughs) <laughs> that's later oh yeah Is she's that like later? you outside so you're not lying in a church yeah it's so good <laughs> and um Catherine's talking to Yanya and she brings up the point uh Yanya brings up the point that it's really hard for parents to admit that they were conned um and Catherine's like yeah I feel like I'm still like deprogramming my dad and Yanya kind of laughs at that her dad is sending her messages that basically says, look, at this point, I don't think writing back and forth about this whole program is really doing any good. I'd be happy to talk to you in person, but I'm over discussing this. And Yanya says, if he's writing that, it means he still doesn't understand what kind of hurt this really caused. Right. Like, okay, can we be done with this now? It's like, no, no. Um, I haven't been able to be done with it for the last decade plus. Which is essentially what she responds to him is like, I'm not done talking about it and I'll probably never be done talking about it. Yeah, because that's her story and her right. Right. She says when she finally gets out, she has a panic attack ordering lunch at a Taco Bell. You see her trying to order something at a drive through after she gets out of the program and she's freaking out because she can't remember how to order a soda. Because she's so completely been manipulated and her deprived of any seeing the fucking sky, having conversations with other humans like you've been deprived of all worldly things. It's I can't imagine kind of trying to reintegrate. So they say that the best way to graduate is to prove that you've been brought into the ideology. Alexa is talking about all the photos of her that were used as promotion. And they start talking about how Alexa, when she became 
an upper level was hurting other kids. Like she finds a document that she doesn't remember writing, but she says there were probably others. And she's talking about how she herself was restraining another child. And Yanya talks about what we've talked about before, which is that this is the moral injury. Like you don't know why you did it. You did it to survive and you did it because you were convinced you had to do it. But it's an injury that you now will always have to carry that they've imposed on you that you became part of it through no fault of your own. Right. You carry regret. Right. Guilt for hurting other people. It's not something you wanted to do. But I I've obviously watched the whole thing, you know, but I'll just mention it now because it's apropos. It's like they mentioned that, you know, if we've learned anything from the Milgram experiment and the Stanford prison experiment, which is so funny because as, as you guys probably know, we've literally just talked about that on the show. It's that people's behavior is extremely influenced by their environment and who's in charge. Yeah, exactly. Like they're totally victims to their own circumstance. One of the experts says they don't show them, they just do the voiceover. But the kids who are successful are the most concerning, not the kids that did not graduate. Because the kids who were the most successful at graduating the program were the ones who would have been forced to take active part of the plan. Diana says that she refused to work the program. So she went to two different programs and was essentially incarcerated for a total of three and a half years because she did not want to be upper level and hurt other children. Yeah. I mean, to have that kind of self-awareness at such a young age is... Wild. Good for her, but I just, it's unbelievable to me. Yeah, it's such a heavy burden to take on as a fucking child. Yeah. (laughs) Your two choices are avoid getting more seriously abused by abusing others and getting to go home or refusing to get to the level where you abuse others and get abused and have your parents think that you're not reformed enough and you have to keep being abused. Those are your choices. Unwinnable situation. And that's also what is called bounded choice, which, uh, you know, Yanya has described in past documentaries um, Mm -hmm. in the Twin Flames documentary where she was interviewed is that people make decisions that for people on the outside, it seems insane. It's like, well, why would you hurt other people? That's crazy. And it's like, no, you don't understand that both options are what you would say is crazy and that are crazy. But it's, you know, turd sandwich or giant douche. Exactly. Nothing's good. They show a letter from Catherine to her dad saying, look, you don't want me home because I'm level three and I don't have enough points to be a level six and you can force me to be here, but you cannot force me to graduate. That's up to me. And she says, so I'm not going to graduate and I'm doing this because I hate you for not wanting me. And then she reads a quote from E.E. E. Cummings, who's a writer, and basically says to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best night and day to make you everybody else means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. And it was something she wrote like on a document at the thing when she was like 15. Which took balls because they don't like rebellious things like that. At the end of the episode, they have this really cool scene where they play a softer version of Girls Just Want to Have Fun, which they said was (laughs) ruined, and they're all bowling and stuff. And while they're at the bowling alley, the call comes in from the woman who is Alexa's family rep and was like, did you leave a paper in my mailbox? And she's like, yes, I did. And her first thing that she says is, I never called you a crack whore. And Alex is like, you didn't, but you wrote it on a name tag. And it was a name I had to go by during all the seminars. And she said, you know, you told my parents I was addicted to drugs. And she says, I don't remember lying to any parents about that stuff. And she's <clears> like, <throat> mm. um, sorry, I don't recall. Um, uh, mm-hmm. I don't recall. What do you mean? Oh, my God. Fallon. You know, that's what people do on the witness stand when they're lying. They oh, like oh, tap oh, the oh. mic and they go, <clears throat> um, I don't recall. And that, oh. then that's their answer to everything because obviously they do recall, but there it's, you know. And if they do recall, they do that infuriating, like, on the advice of my lawyer and counsel, I am pleading the Fifth Amendment, right? Like that. Have you ever seen interrogations where every question, the person's like, I don't know, I don't know? Yes. I would beat that person, but anyhow. 
so she asks the family rep to talk about things that had happened at Ivy Ridge. And the family rep says, you girls have nothing but bad things to say about me. And the sad thing is, and this is a direct quote, I was probably one of the only people that really fucking loved you all and cared about what happened to you. Super weird way of showing it. (laughs) And Alexa was like, because she's like, why do you care about this now? And Alexa's like, because we have evidence now. We have every piece of evidence we could need. We have letters, records, videotapes, security footage. And the rep says, maybe I was a little brainwashed and I did think the program would help you. So Alexa says, okay, talk to my parents. and. Take accountability for what you told them, your part in splintering my family. And the rep says, I'm not taking accountability for something I don't believe I did. And Alexa says, you are not working your program and you're playing the victim. Boom. The rep starts screaming and says, you're trying to make me the only person accountable. And Alexa says, you are not the only person accountable, but you are one of many people that contributed to a lifetime of trauma for me. And the rep goes, and? And she's like, that's what you have to say to me. And all the people around the table have their hands over their mouths in absolute shock. So they're they just, making the same faces. They me. just hang up the call. And we're almost done. We're going to talk about Catherine getting out. She says that abuse thrives in silence and victims stay silent because of shame and humiliation. And she sees that in some way her dad is a victim for falling for this. But They're not scared of these people anymore, which is why they're speaking out. She's wondering how to talk to her dad and finally agrees to sit down with him. So they show their first like interaction. I think it's amazing because she sits down on this chair and lets him sit on like a wooden table. (laughs) (laughs) It just shoves him, shoves a microphone in his face. Right. (laughs) And he's just sort of like laughing uncomfortably and going, I'm really sorry for that. And it's good to see you. You know, I missed you. He says he wished he'd figured it out quickly and it's a terrible mistake and he's really sorry. She asks how, like, how did you send me away? And he's like, well, wait, I agree with you on this whole program. It does manipulate parents. But then he just realizes he's not doing any good and he just sort of stops and is like, I'm so, so sorry. Mm -hmm. Then the conversation ends and she recognizes like this is not going to happen in one discussion. She said she was at the facility when she was in the program and she's she was level four and she got pulled out by a teacher and was getting like screamed at all the way over teacher a teacher in heavy air quotes yeah as you would say (laughs) (laughs) they tell her she's going to jason finlinson's office and when she gets there her dad is there and he's there to take her home she says it was like a total blur and they their whole goal is just to like get you out the door as fast as possible so you don't get to say goodbye to your friends or anybody you know you just leave because they don't want people knowing that your parents can just take you home she also said like the whole way home she was physically ill there was this weird mix of being overwhelmed but also happiness and this is what really triggered her anxiety disorder she suffers from extreme social anxiety and when she got out Every bit of her life was super overwhelming. She would wander around the grocery store and wasn't sure what to do. She missed all these really big pop culture things. She's like, when did Lindsay Lohan become a cultural icon? Like the girl from the parent trap. Right. I'll (laughs) never forgive them for taking away my right to see Mean Girl in the theaters for the first time. True that. Okay. She was constantly worried about being sent back. She was on eggshells around her stepmother, basically just like, let me get to 18 so that I don't get sent back to the program. Can you imagine just being constantly afraid that you're going to get kidnapped in the fucking night again? Oh, my God. And sent back. And like poor Diana, the one who they blamed on her father's death on the that girl, she left Ivy Ridge and was out for three months. And then she was sent right back to another program where the school director had recently been convicted of sexually abusing children. I cannot. So after Diana graduates and graduates is also in heavy air quotes, as we'll hear about in the next episode, he took her and other kids on a trip to a seminar after they graduated to the Litchfield estate. (gasps) We're going to talk about the Litchfield. And we're going to talk about who Litchfield is, but basically the, the founder of all of this. The grounds have multiple pools, rivers, guest houses. There's elaborate fountain statues of all Litchfield's kids. Creepy little... <sighs> 
baby statues. And she found out after that that her total cost for attendance was $175,000 over her three years. And when she told her mother about the estate, her mom was like, oh, that's where the money went. And that's sort of how the next episode will kick off is talking about that money trail. And that is (sighs) episode two, baby. (laughs) Dude, good job. Because somehow it took me a long time to, I don't know, there's just like a lot to go over in every episode, but episode one too, just, I don't know. I wanted to to guard her heart, to use our Christian throwback. I want to, I want to guard your heart. (laughs) Thank you. And I wanted to plow oh through heart. that like a bulldozer to try to save us both. <laughs> you did. You did great. Great job. Do I get to say the beginning of our key phrase? I mean, Tell because them. that was Go ahead. real as fuck. And real fucked up. <laughs> you guys, my goodness, we have to talk about this one more time. I'm so sorry. We have one more episode. <laughs> We're going to get our horse on. <laughs> I I can't. You know what, though? Next episode, we have some good news, which is ayo. Yeah. So, uh, we'll uh, we'll see you then. There's nothing left to say except good night. Good good luck. Good night. Seriously. Good luck. Yeah. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye. God. Bye. (laughs) (laughs) That's fucked up. I'm so fucked up. Can't you see? It's just really fucked up. That's fucked up.